This morning we are going to finish up our look um, at what Solomon says to men and women in the book of Proverbs. We spent the last two weeks just looking at Proverbs and just studying what, is, what would Solomon advise us as men, as women, as husbands, as fathers, as wives, as mothers. It's important to note something right from the onset. Solomon was a man who looked for happiness in everything. He looked for happiness in marriage. He looked for happiness in relationships. He looked for happiness in sex, in children, in work, in pleasure, in wealth, you name it. He looked for joy, for contentment, for happiness in all of these things. But ultimately, he discovers that none of these things bring him satisfaction. We learn by reading the book of Ecclesiastes that he looked for happiness in all of these things but could not find satisfaction. We also discover that he wasn't just a chauvinistic man, a prude man, or a man who simply used women or um, just took advantage of women. He really loved his wife. He, in fact, writes one of the most poetic, one of the most incredible love stories in the entire world, not just in the Bible, but in the book called Song of Solomon. He's done a lot. He's enjoyed a lot, been through a lot, learned a lot. Solomon, the wisest king, has much to say on this topic. He has tremendous advice to give us um, about life, about marriage, about family, about children, even about work, and a ton of other things. A lot of his advice he obtained from his God-given wisdom. He was the wisest man ever to live. A lot of his advice he gives because of the experiences that he's gone through in life, the choices that he made. We mentioned last week and the week before that Solomon had married 700 women. He had 300 mistresses. That's a lot of influence on one person. And a lot of these women ended up influencing him to turn away from God and to worship other gods. And at the end of his life, he takes his sons and his daughters and takes them on a journey and begins to give them advice on how to live life. Most of these advices are written in a book that we call Proverbs. So far, we've covered five things that he would say for men and five things that he would say for women. To you men, I've challenged you over the last two, week, two weeks that you are to be leaders of instruction in the home. It is your responsibility to instruct, lead, and be the spiritual leader of your home. You are the leaders of work ethic. You are not called to be lazy sitting in front of your, the video games when you get home from work, but you are to be the examples of work ethic to your wives and to your children. You are leaders to be of protection and integrity. It is your responsibility to protect your wife, to protect your children, to protect your home. That is your God-given responsibility. You're called to be leaders of presence, that you don't simply work and provide, but you are there for your family. You spend time with your family. You spend time with your children. You invest in them. You are called to be leaders of thankfulness and praise. It is your responsibility to be one that lifts up your spouse. It is your responsibility to be one that finds the good in the situation. It is your responsibility to be thankful to God for all of his blessings in your life. And when you do that, uh, your home will be filled with thanksgiving. This applies to you guys now that are married and you single folks that are looking for marriage. If you single guys don't begin practicing these things now in your life, you'll never do them when you get married. So start applying these things in your life now. To you ladies, I've challenged you as well. You are called to be models of faithfulness, to live your life in a faithful manner. You're called to be models of silence and wisdom, not loud, not boisterous, not always causing a commotion, but in your wisdom, in your silence, you would be honored. You're called to be, leave a legacy, be more interested in leaving a legacy that will go beyond your job, your career, vo your vocation, but one that will inspire your children and your children's children. I challenge you to be models of diligence, working hard, not just l being lazy, not just sitting on the couch, not just letting things be, but to be hardworking in what you do. This applies to you, whether you are married or you're single. To you, if you're single, there are choices that you make now that affect your future when you're married and when you have children. Plan and prepare your life now for your future. As I reminded you these past two weeks, this morning is not an opportunity for you to nudge your spouse and give them a guilt trip. That is not the point of this message. I do a good job of making your spouse angry with me all by myself. I don't need your help. This is an opportunity for you to apply the truths of, to your own life and ask Jesus to help you if you're not able to do that. For you single folks, these are truths that you need to apply to your life now. But these are also truths that you need to be looking for in the opposite sex for the person that God has for your life. 
So I'm going to give you this morning three more things for guys, three more things for women. But I'm going to really focus on one thing for men and one thing for women, and we'll briefly touch the other two things. But for you guys, number one, you are called to be leaders of discipline in the home. You're called to be leaders of discipline in the home. It's vital that you men take the lead of discipline of your children in the home. A lot of you don't have kids, so I'm preparing you now for your future. I've seen too many guys take the back seat on the issue and let their wives take the lead. Or I've seen families where the kids know that dad is the soft one and they can get away with anything with dad. He never disciplines, never corrects. In fact, he encourages foolish behavior and then shrugs off responsibility when the kids get in trouble. In doing so, they fail their children, they fail their wives, they fail their God. Many of the problems in society today are due to absent fathers or fathers that are present but, not, but just in the body, but never involved or care enough to discipline or teach their children. Today, we make excuses for everything, especially with children. We don't discipline them or we give them pills to fix them because we fail to do something. For example, one of the diagnoses that has become extremely popular with kids lately is this thing called bipolar, um, bipolar diagnosis. And I don't mean to take this lightly, especially if you know someone that's been diagnosed with bipolar. However, the stats say that bipolar diagnosis is up in kids over 40% in the last 15 years. The criteria for adults to be labeled bipolar is if you drive your car fast, have sex with a lot of people, and spend a lot of money that you don't have. That pretty much describes a lot, probably about 80% of UTD campus or any other campus in society, right? That pretty much describes our entire society in this city. For kids under seven, here's the criteria. Doing wild things on a bike, giving away their possessions, and inappropriately exposing themselves. That's how you label a kid bipolar. So if my son happens to enjoy doing stunts on his bike, which most boys do, if he gives half of his sandwich to a classmate because he doesn't want to eat that day, and he pees in the backyard, then he's pretty much bipolar, and he should be on pills. That's pretty much what they're saying. We make excuses for everything, and instead of taking time to sit and talk and correct and discipline children, we take the responsibility off of our shoulders and blame anyone and everyone else. Newsweek, which is a fairly incredibly liberal magazine, said it better that it's better to spank than never spank at all. Spanking regularly isn't the problem, the article says. The problem is having no regular discipline at all. They go on to note that 25% of kids today are never spanked. What they discovered is that those who are spanked just when they are between the ages of two and six are, do better as teenagers than those who've never been spanked their entire lives. Socially, morally, emotionally, academically, all of that. So we shouldn't be surprised that we find this in the Bible. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. He's telling his son that ju just like I love you and discipline you because of my love for you, God is going to discipline you as well. He's not paying you back. He's not punishing you. He's trying to keep you safe. He's trying to protect you from ruining your life. Listen to that text carefully. Look at it again. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary in his reproof. For the Lord reproves whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Before any father proceeds to discipline his children, there's another command that's given. You are called to delight in them. You don't simply correct them, but you're called to delight in them. That's what it says. Practically, this means that most of your time as a father should be spent in enjoying your children, encouraging your children, laughing with your children, being affectionate with your children, playing with your children, delighting in your children, to build a deep bond of love and affection with their children that when, they, when you discipline them, they know it's because you love them. This goes back to the idea of being present in their lives and being there for them. Look at this verse, Proverbs 22, verse 6. We're familiar with this. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The idea behind this verse, train up a child in the way that he should go, conveys the idea that every child is different. Every child is unique. How I train my daughter is going to be completely different from how I train my son. They respond differently. They think differently. They behave differently. Teach them in the way they should go. This is not a promise. This is a truism. 
Training up a child in a Godward direction sets them in the right course for life. Sadly, the opposite is also true. If you do nothing with them, if you never correct them, if you never instruct them, if you never discipline them, if you never point them toward Jesus, you are a foolish father and you're going to destroy their lives and destroy yours along the way. Therefore, it's imperative as a wise father to let his child, to get his child going in the right direction by God's grace to help him continue to do that. Let me say this, a lot of you guys aren't fathers. This applies in the area of discipling someone. You see someone that's living in sin. If you don't point them toward Jesus, you are not being a good follower of Jesus. Discipline is not just a fatherly, motherly issue. It's, call, it's for all of us as believers. You are called to point people toward Jesus. Proverbs 22:15, Folly is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Let me give you another verse. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, from death. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your child. Let me make this clear. A lot of us have grown up in homes where we've experienced discipline, but it wasn't godly discipline. The discipline that he's talking about is not angry discipline. It's not the discipline that happens because our kids fail to live up to our expectations and our dreams for their lives. It is not discipline because they offended you or disrespected you. This happens with your spouse and with your kids. They disrespect you and you get offended, you get angry. And the reason you're upset and angry is because of the idols of your heart, because of what's being exposed inside of you. Discipline is not about retribution. You need to constantly check the idols of your heart to make sure that you are not disciplining out of anger because you were offended. Remember, the goal of discipline is not to make kids or people conform to your image, your wishes, your desires. The purpose of discipline is not to punish children, but to correct them. The purpose of discipline is to make them more like Jesus, nothing else. Often we mess up on this. We think the point of discipline is to make them do everything we want them to do. And we end up correcting them for all of their faults without ever pointing them to Jesus. The point is to always take them back to the cross. That's what discipline is for. This is hard to do, especially when you're angry or you're hurt. I've learned in our own house that the best method for me to discipline my kids is to wait till I cool down, take them to their room where they're not being disciplined in front of other people. I ask them why they're in trouble. I make them walk out, walk through and talk through why they're about to get in trouble. I ask them why they did what they did. Let them understand the reasons for their getting in trouble. I remind them the importance of discipline and that I'm not doing this because I want them to be perfect, but because God has great plans for their lives and want the best for their lives. I discipline them at that point. But then I pause. I hug them. I pray for them. I tell them I love them. Why? Because I don't want them to think that their parents doesn't love them. The ultimate goal of discipline is to remind them that Jesus loves them, that they want their lives to be changed. Often this means I have to wait till I cool down, and I've got to remember the goal of why I'm correcting them. It also helps me to see if I'm disciplining them because of them wanting to be more like me or because I really want them to be more like Jesus. Sometimes it helps me to cool down and reflect and see, why am I really angry? Is it because they hurt me or because they, are, because they need to be corrected so they can live their lives for Jesus? So many times, this has put me in situations where I would have to get in front of my kids and apologize because I got angry at them or disciplined them for things that wasn't about them living for Jesus or living in a correct manner, but because they made me uncomfortable or they annoyed me or they were bothering me because I was trying to watch TV and they were trying to get in the way. And so you've got to check your heart when it comes to discipline. Men, you are called to be leaders of discipline in the home. Don't take that lightly. When you do that in a loving manner, when you do that because you are in love with your kids and you want them to see Jesus in their lives, they will honor you, they will respect you, and they will bring you honor as you grow old. 
Number two, men, you are to be leaders of honesty and contentment. What your family needs from you more than anything else is honesty and contentment. Proverbs 30, verse 7 through 9 is a great prayer. The man prays, he says, two things I ask of you, God. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove me far from falsehood and lying. That's the first thing. And then give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. What a great prayer. It's a prayer of asking God to make you honest and making you content. You will destroy your life by being dishonest. You will destroy your family by being a hypocrite. Most of the people in our city have been exposed to Christianity, um, and they are opposed to it because they've experienced people that were hypocrites, either by a father, a husband, a church leader, or whatever. It's everywhere, and that's why people hate Christianity. Not because they hate Jesus, but because the followers of Jesus don't live up to be examples of Jesus. Don't be a hypocrite. It's only when you get and apply the gospel to your life that you actually begin to change in this. If you truly believe that Jesus took all of your punishment and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, he took it all, he has forgiven you, and all that matters is what he thinks about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you anymore. It doesn't matter what people say about you because Jesus has approved you. You can be honest. You can be transparent. He died for you. He loves you. He received you. It doesn't matter what other people think of you, and you can be honest, and you don't have to hide stuff. You don't have to hide your sin. You can be open, transparent. As for contentment, again, when you understand that Jesus died for you and brought you into his family, made you his brother, made you the son of God, the daughter of God, made you into his family, you can receive that. You are able to be content. You don't have to have the latest gadget or the gizmos. gizmos. You can be content with what God has given you because he's given you more than enough when he sent his son to die for you. Only when you be content in whatever circumstance in, you're in, knowing that God is for you and not against you, can you be content in your home. Most of us live our lives thinking that God is against us and that he's sitting in heaven waiting for us to fail so that he could make our lives miserable. But have you wrestled with the idea that God is for you? The creator of the universe, the one who made everything, he says, I'm for you. When everyone else fails you, I'm there with you. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will open doors for you. I will work on your behalf. I'm the one that is standing before you. I'm the one that takes away the enemy that was standing before you. I am for you. When you realize that, guys, you can be content where you are in life, knowing God is faithful. It doesn't mean you don't work hard. It doesn't mean you don't take care of your family. But you don't have to strive for possessions. You strive to make sure your family is taken care of. There's a huge world of difference. Number three, guys, you are leaders of restraint and justice. Your wife and your children need you to have sound wisdom and a clear head. They need to see that you are in love with Jesus, not in love with a bottle, not in love with drugs, not in love with food, not in love with sex, not in love with pornography, not in love with sports, not in love with money, not in love with anything else, just Jesus. That's what they need to see in your life. They need to see you lead a life on mission. They need to see you lead a life of justice for the poor and the needy. Proverbs 31, verses 2 on down. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy king. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Verse 8, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. See, there's nothing better than leading your family this way. Leading your family by caring for people, loving those who are hurting, helping those who need a helping hand. What an example it sets for your wife, for your children, when they see you as leaders of who are concerned for the injustices of the world. 
What an example it sets when they see you concerned for those who are struggling, those who are hurting. Does your family see you as someone who is passionate about justice around them or someone that's just too consumed with their own lives? Your kids will pick it up easily. My kids pick this up very easily. We could be having a conversation about an individual and the struggles that they're going through, and all of a sudden in the evening, Nicole will remember to pray for that person. And she will, in her prayers, pray for that person. In her prayers, she'll stop and say, God, would you heal that person? Would you help that person? Would you provide for that person? Why? Because they are concerned about the needs of others. And they pick that up from us. You're to be men that the first thing people know about you is your love for Jesus. When people see you, the first thing that should be talked about is that you are a person that loves Jesus. Not your love for sports. Not your love for gadgets. Not your love for the church. Not your love for a good drink. Not your love for being humorous or funny. But that you are genuinely in love with Jesus. Don't let anything else get in the way of that. Be men that love Jesus. When you are in love with Jesus, it becomes easy to lead your home because you know what's best for the home because you're passionately about Jesus and you want to do whatever honors him. Ladies, three things for you. Number one, you are to be models of submission. Models of submission. The, the Bible makes it clear over and over that the husband is supposed to be responsible for leading the home and the wife is supposed to come under his leadership. Yes, I know we live in the 21st century, and yes, I know the feminist movement is against us, but this is in the Bible. This is what it says. Jesus could have bucked the system. If he really wanted to be a trendsetter, he could have, but he didn't. He elevated the role of women in ways that no one else did in that time. There was a very low view of women in culture in the time that Jesus lived, and he elevated that view significantly. The church elevated that view significantly. It was a common in culture at that time for families to toss out baby girls, leave them on the ground, exposed, and let them die. They only wanted boys, boys that could help them with their jobs, boys that could help them manage the fields, boys that could help them protect the home. If the wife had a baby girl, they would throw the baby out. The church in the first century came along and said, that's not right. And they forbid that to happen within the church. They fought that within the culture to make that stop. And, and eventually it was stopped. There was no value for unmarried women in that culture. If you weren't married, you were nothing. They basically treated you like dirt, especially if you're a widow. You ha would have to get married if you wanted any significance in that culture. The church came in and said, no, we'll take care of you. We'll provide for you. We'll put people in charge to make sure that you're fed. We'll put people in charge. We'll set aside a group of people that will make sure that you're taken care of. They completely changed the way culture looked at widows, at women. The idea of cohabitation was huge in the Greco-Roman world. In that culture, if you were a woman and you weren't married, you didn't get a lot of value in that culture or society. You weren't protected by marriage. The only way you were protected and granted safety was if you were married. So cohabitation was pretty big. Men would sleep with women for a while without ever making any commitment to her. Then the church came and stood against that and gave protection for single women. The men were allowed to have mistresses in that culture. They could have adultery if they wanted to. The church steps in and says, no, we're not going to tolerate that in the church. It was a different view that Jesus had from the culture that he was in. But he still maintained that the wife's role as a partner is a co-worker in marriage with the role of submission to her husband. The resistance of that submission results in a home that doesn't know down from up and left from right. It becomes a home of constant bickering, fighting, contending for the lead. Look at this verse, Proverbs 21, 9. It is better to live in the corner of a house stop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Ten verses down later, he repeats it. It's Proverbs 21, 19. It's better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and a fretful wife. Solomon's saying that this unsubmissive woman is always negative, always disagreeing, and you can see it in how she's constantly cutting her husband, cutting him down, cutting him off, plain disrespectful. For the husband in the situation, it's basically a lose-lose situation. You get into an argument, if you lose the argument, you lose. If you win the argument, you still lose. 
So the conclusion that Solomon comes up with is you might as well just go to your roof and hide and cave out there because it's better to stay and hide there than to go live with your quarrelsome wife. Or go into a desert and just camp out there for a few days because it's better to be there than with your quarrelsome wife. You may win the argument, but you're going to lose the war. Proverbs 27, 15. It says, A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand. Give me one more verse. Proverbs 19, 13. A foolish son is a ruin to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. It's interesting, that verse right there. It, says, it talks about the relationship to the son to the father and the relationship to the wife to the husband. Basically, he's saying that if you're going to be a quarreling wife, your children will be foolish as well. They will learn to disrespect your husband as well. They will learn to badmouth him as well. They will learn to not take him seriously. They will learn to not to give him the time of day. And they learn that from you. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this topic, but I think it's important to know the difference between what biblical submission is and what it is not. A lot of us think that submission is you tell, the husband tells the wife what to do and she just has to do it, but that's not the idea of biblical submission. John Piper, a pastor in Minnesota, does a phenomenal message on this topic, which I encourage you to read or listen to online. But he states that biblical submission does not mean that you agree with everything that your husband says. It doesn't mean that you leave your brain or your will at the altar on your wedding day. It does not mean avoiding every effort to change your husband. It does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. It does not mean that the wife gets a gets her spiritual, personal, and physical strength from the husband. And it does not mean that the wife acts out of fear. He goes on to say that biblical submission is a disposition to follow a husband's authority and an inclination to yield to his leadership. It's an attitude that says, I delight for you to take the initiative in our family. I'm glad when you take responsibility for things and you lead with love. I don't flourish when you're passive. The family doesn't go well when you don't lead. And I have to make sure the family works. But the attitude of Christian submission also says, it grieves me when you venture into sinful acts and you force me to come with you. You know I can't do that. I have no desire to resist you. On the contrary, I flourish most when I respond joyfully to your lead. But I can't follow you into sin. As much as I love to honor your leadership in our marriage, Jesus is my king. That's biblical submission. I know I'm speaking to women right now, but let me pause and speak to guys. Guys, we joke and we tell the women to submit all the time. Let's be honest. When we love the way that we're supposed to love, there's no struggle for women to submit, your wives to submit. The command for the wife to submit to your leadership is predicated upon a command in Scripture for you to love your wife like Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for her. He died for her. He sacrificed everything for her. Until you are ready to die for your wife, to love her the way Christ loves her, then you better not demand for her to submit to you. Let me also say, when you do love her the way Christ loves the church, your life your wife will be joyfully and gladly submit to your leadership because she sees your love for Jesus and for her. You are called to love her the way Christ loves the church. Number two, women, you are called to be models of prayer. Proverbs thirty-one twenty-five: Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. This woman is content. She's able to pray. There is a dependence on God. That means prayer for her is of primary importance in her life. She, you should be women that pray. Your constant prayer should be that, God, would you make me a woman of prayer? If there's nothing else you can do to serve others and further the Great Commission, you can certainly be a prayer warrior around your home. You can saturate your home in prayer why you clean the dishes, why you make a meal, why you change a diaper, why you are just hanging out with your family. You can send a prayer to God for our nation, for our city, for our schools, for our church, for our community, for the lost. You can be women of prayer. 
a woman on her knees does more for a nation than, 3, 000, than a thousand three-piece suits in Wall Street. Be a woman of prayer. You can be a faithful prayer warrior on behalf of your husband and children as your first and primary mission field. You can bless and do good to your husband by diligently laboring in prayer on his behalf. Satan desires to destroy your husband, his character, his leadership. Satan will do everything to tempt him, to stray, make him stray away from home. You can be diligent in praying for him. You can be diligent in seeking God's face for him. I talked to someone just recently. God just started putting on her heart to pray for her husband. And she started praying. She didn't know why. And she realized a few weeks later that her husband was being tempted. God warned her way before he destroyed his marriage. Be women of prayer. Be women that are listening to God's voice. Be listening I and mean, sensitive to God's voice that you're praying for your family, praying for your children. Satan desires to steal away the hearts of your children. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. There's a great motivation for you to be on the front lines, alert, equipped with the word of God, praying his truth over your family. Listen, instead of nagging your husband to make changes in his life, you should be the one that takes it to God first. If you want him to exercise and you're telling him to exercise and telling him to exercise and you're not listening to you, go to God, talk to him. God knows you can't change him. You've tried, but he can, right? Talk to God first. And instead of having unnecessary arguments because he doesn't listen to you, would you talk to the one that can actually change him? And if he doesn't change, don't blame your husband. Just keep praying and give him a break. We know we need exercise. We'll get to it eventually. Um, prayer is a powerful tool. Praise God for the ability to enter into his courts freely and to be able to lay our burdens down to him. Praise God that we don't have to go through a priest. We don't have to go through some other person. We don't have to offer sacrifices of lambs and goats. But any time you need, you can go into his presence and you can say, God, would you bless my husband? Would you bless my children? You single folks, most of you are in your 20s. You don't know where your future spouse is, but guaranteed, he's already or she's already alive, right? He's, uh, hopefully, for some of you. <laughs> but, but they're alive. Pause for a moment and say, God, I don't know who you have for me, but I know that in your perfect time, you will bring that person. Would you guard his life? Would you protect him now that he doesn't fall into sin, that it doesn't destroy our marriage later? You single guys, pray for your future spouse. God, I don't know who she is, but would you already begin to work in her heart that she would be a woman that loves Jesus? You can be examples of prayer. You can be models of prayer, trusting Jesus, that you can go to his feet and lay your burdens down. He hears your cries, and he answers them in perfect timing. One of the things I do in premarital counseling is one of the first sessions I tell the couples, I say, give me five reasons or six things that you always wanted in your spouse. And they list them out and the spouse, the future spouse lists them out. And the next question is, give me 10 reasons why you decided to marry this person. Oftentimes, the things that they desired are the same things that are on their second list. God knows the desires of your heart. You don't have to go find it. He knows exactly where it is. And he knows he placed those desires in you. He is working already for you. Be people of prayer. Trust Jesus. And finally, women, you are called to be models of instruction. Proverbs 31, 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She teaches her children. She's involved with other women around her. She's discipling other ladies. She pours into people the wisdom that God has given her. She's familiar with the laws of God. And this is the secret to true lasting happiness. Therefore, she can guide her children in the way of life, instill wisdom in them, morality in them, virtue into their hearts and minds that they shall be able to live with for the rest of their lives. As much as we yell at men to be available for their children, ladies, you know you have the most influence on your children. You do. You're the one who's there when they're hurting. They don't run to, guy, they don't run to the dad when a, someone breaks their heart. 
They don't run to dads when they need something. They run to moms. You're the ones who influence them the most. Pour into them. Instruct them. Influence your children in your home through your words, through your acts, through your deeds. A mom knows the right things to say, and children listen. Let me close. Let me remind you what I've reminded you the last two weeks. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that you're going to find all of these requirements in some person out there. Those of you who are married, I don't want you to think that your spouse will meet all of these requirements. Not just the ones we talked about today, but the ones we've talked about in the previous weeks. What you're looking for in your spouse can never be found. No person out there will meet all of these requirements. To make them into a functional savior who will deliver you from whatever you're going through in life is going to put a huge burden on them. To deliver you from insignificance, to deliver you from a lack of respect, to deliver you from loneliness, to deliver you from lack of pleasure, to deliver you from companionship, whatever element you want to put in there. If you think you can find someone out there that will save you from all of these things, you're wrong. You'll never find it. It will never work. You will either destroy them or you'll destroy yourself. You will crush them by putting on them a weight that they cannot bear to be your savior and to deliver you and to make your life satisfied. Or you will crush yourself trying to be a savior for them. Your spouse, your children, your future spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend will never be your savior. There is a savior that you need and his name is Jesus. Whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian, he still needs to be your significance. His name is Jesus. He is your ultimate joy. He is your ultimate satisfaction. He is your ultimate companionship. All of those things are found in him. And until you find that in him, you will destroy your life trying to find that in somewhere else. Jesus is not only your leader, men. He's not only your model, women. He is your redeemer. He is your greatest treasure. Jesus is more attractive, of more worth, of more joy, of more precious than any person out there in this world, including your spouse. Why is that? Because he exchanged his beauty and his glory for horror, for shame. He gave his beauty up for ashes. Isaiah 53 says that God saw no beauty in him that we should desire him. If there was anyone that was supposed to be beautiful in the world, if there was anyone that was supposed to be attractive, if there was anyone that we were supposed to be in awe of, it was Jesus. But on the cross, he was beaten for you. He was abused for you. He was mangled for you. He was destroyed for you. And the Bible says that we hid our faces from him. We could not even look on him because it was, it was a frightening sight. He gave everything up to draw you in so that he can make you beautiful. He can make you a child of God. He can make you perfect. He can make you forgiven. He can make you accepted. He can make you loved. He did that for you. You will have to be overwhelmed with the beauty of Jesus, with the beauty of him, overwhelmed with the beauty of the bloodied Savior hanging on the cross of Calvary, who died for your sin, who took your place, who took the punishment that you deserved. When that is beautiful for you, here's what happens. Your spouse will be put in the right position. Your children will be put in the right position. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, will be put in the right position. They won't be a savior for you, trying to make your life perfect. Jesus will be your savior. He will be your God. He will be your redeemer. He will change your life completely. And when he does, you will be able, when he does, you will be able to love, to cherish, to care, to submit to all of those things because to your spouse because Jesus is your ultimate joy your ultimate satisfaction. And if your spouse fails you, which he will, which she will, it's okay. And he will fail you. She will fail you. But if your joy is there, you will be disappointed. But when you focus your eyes, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations on Jesus, you know that he is in control of your life, that he is good, that he is faithful, that he has got the details of your life orchestrated. This morning we come to the table, we come knowing that in and of ourselves, we are never able to do these things. We can never be leaders the way God's calling us to be leaders. We can never be models the way God's calling us to be models. We fail and we fail miserably, all of us do. But the table reminds us on a consistent basis that we don't come because of our works, we come because of God's grace. That he doesn't just simply leave us alone to do this, but he dies for us so that he can redeem us, restore relationship to us. And then he sends his spirit to live inside of us so that 
we can live the life that he calls us to live. So we come to the table. We come in absolute humility. We come in absolute submission, saying, Jesus, if you hadn't died for me, my life would have been destroyed. My life would have been a mess. My marriage would have been a mess. My parenting would have been a mess. But thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me, the worst of sinners. And we also come knowing that living our life is not on ourselves, but the table reminds us that because he died, this spirit now lives inside of us. So we come knowing that, God, our dependence is on you. That when we live out this week of trying to be a good dad, trying to be a good husband, trying to be a good wife, trying to be a good mom, that we do that not in our own faith and our own trust, but we do that in absolute dependence on the Holy Spirit. So we come to the table this morning in an act of gratitude and worship. We also come in an act of absolute dependence on Jesus. I invite you to examine your hearts, examine your lives, see if there's any affections, any thoughts, any desires that aren't from Jesus. See if you're trusting in yourself too much to try to be something that you're not. See if you're trusting in your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend to be your savior, which he sure she shouldn't be. And would you repent? And would you come grab the elements from the table? Would you worship Jesus for what he's done for you? Would you ask him to help you in the decisions of your life? And then I'll come back and we'll partake of the table together. So let's pray. Father, the call that you give to us as your children is a challenging one. You don't simply save us and leave us to do life, but you call us to live our lives for your glory. Oftentimes we're content with simply making it through the day, but that's not what we're called for. We're called to leave a legacy that goes beyond us, beyond our children, a legacy that will go to our children's children. And we cannot do that on our own. We fail. We don't do a good job at parenting. We're miserable at being good husbands and good wives. We discipline and we fail at that. We fail at submission. We struggle in our prayer walk. We struggle at being content with the things you've given us. We struggle with caring for the loss, for the injustice that's happening in the world. But we come this morning saying we need your help. We need you to help us do the things you called us to do. And the table is such a great reminder that you never leave us. Such a great reminder of your incredible love for us. We thank you. We love you.